Hey guys, thanks for joining us and welcome to Teradex Live to Air Studio. Uh, today's production is being done completely on the iPad with our Live to Air application, but that's not what this stream is going to be about. Today we're going in depth with the Teradex Sphere. Uh, we're going to cover a number of different things today. What's in the box, how to get a basic GoPro mount uh, or rig mounted up. We're going to talk a little bit about the software, how to stitch, do lens correction and color correction. And then we'll take a, a couple of questions at the end to make sure that we answer any lingering things that you guys uh, wanted to know about the system. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Dylan and Richard here, two of our developers of Sphere. They're going to be helping answering a lot of these questions. Uh, I know Richard's a, a major pro with a lot of our hardware, and uh, Dylan here has spent a lot of time with the software. So um, if you guys want to ask questions a little bit early, feel free to do it in the comments, and we'll get to them at the end of the show. Uh, so let's dig in. Um, as you can see right here, the Teradex Sphere is going to come inside an SKB case. This is actually pretty common with what we ship the Teradex bolts with and the cubes now. Uh, inside, what you'll see is uh, a nice um, custom-made foam. We include uh, four different HDMI cables. I know this doesn't look really good. In addition to an Ethernet cable, the four HDMIs were meant to be used with the four GoPros uh, for the standard rig that we say you could use with this. Uh, by all means, you don't need to use this. It's just kind of a courtesy. What we also include is the standard AC adapter. One thing I do want to point out with this is we're shipping these only with US plugs now. So for any of you in Europe or around the world, uh, for now, you will need to get a converter to have it work with your own power system. It's pretty simple to do. It's only a couple of bucks. Uh, we also include our popular machined aluminum GoPro mount. And we had this at NAB if you guys went by our booth then. Um, it's very, very simple. It's a four camera GoPro mount. And uh, one of the nice things about it also is that it includes a quarter 20 mounting uh, bracket. And what this will allow you to do is put this on the side of a tripod, onto a cheese plate, and we'll actually show you one of the rigs that we built uh, to show you how it's been used uh, in, in action, basically. And finally, the star of the show, the Teradex Sphere. Um, this is a little bit different than what you saw at NAB. It's half the size of the prototype we had. Um, it's about uh, maybe a little bit bigger than an Apple TV and, an, and a little bit heavier, but this thing is pretty sexy. Um, on one side, you'll see the four HDMI inputs. And again, with Sphere, you can use any HDMI camera, whether it's GoPros, uh, Sony A7 DSLRs, all the way up to RED cameras, which we've used at Cinegear. The four USB ports are actually meant to be used to power GoPros if you wanted to. Um, and I believe they can actually extend the battery life of DSLRs. Is that right, Richard? In, in some cases, a lot of, a lot of the A7, um, DH4, don't actually accept power over HDMI, but there are some cameras out there that do. Cool. Um, on the back side, and actually let me get this out of the way really quickly. I'm going to hand this over to Richard. The back side, what you'll see is we've got uh, two LIMO connectors. Now, my understanding is that the LIMO connectors were used for redundant power. Why do we have two, though? It's essentially you have one plugged in with a battery. If you need battery swaps, you can actually have a second cable plugged into the device so that you can pull your dead battery wall before, or sorry, you can pull your dead battery after a new live battery is plugged in. So you don't lose power if, if you have sort of a long scene, um, like a nature shot or a, just a surf cam where you want to watch continuously. You don't want to interrupt that, but you don't have the battery life to, to continue it indefinitely. Gotcha. And so you wouldn't be able to do a power loop say, from the second LIMO into a second sphere, right? That's not some, like our old Bond no. product? Okay. No. The power goes in and in. Okay. It doesn't come out. All right, great. And we've got two Ethernet ports, which uh, many of you will remember from um, NAB. Now, one says PoE out. The other says 10100. Is there any difference between the two? Can I plug just a standard Ethernet connection to my router into the PoE, even if it doesn't accept PoE? Yeah, sure. So the, the both ports are. 10100 Ethernet ports. The difference with the PoE port, um, and there's a switch on the side that turns on PoE, which stands for Power Over Ethernet, um, is to be used if you have something like a, a PoE-capable wireless access point, like a Ubiquiti Rocket. Um, that can actually be plugged directly into here with no other cables and powered from it. So this turns on or off the PoE. So it's just a simplified solution to just get wireless built into the, or connected to the sphere. And, and something important to 
remind everybody is that the Sphere does ha has no network connectivity built in. You do have to provide your own router and wireless solution. Um, so this uh, other Ethernet port can actually be used to daisy chain a second unit. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So when you say no connectivity, it doesn't have an internet connection built in. So if the goal with this is live streaming to the web, yes, you need a separate internet connection. Otherwise, you're going to need something Wi-Fi to connect your iPad to do the stitching. Um, but this can certainly be used. They loop through. They bridge. Um, so you can connect two Ethernet cables and any device on one connected on one side will see the device on the other side. Awesome. And there is a limitation. You can only connect two spheres at the same time, daisy chaining them through a single Ethernet port. Is that correct? For all practical purposes, yeah. Gotcha. No, no reason you'd need to connect more than that. OK, cool. And uh, one other thing that's new for the sphere that uh, I don't believe it's going to be too easy to see is we've now got an analog audio input. It's a three and a half millimeter a jack. Tiny guys here. Um, it's, I, I believe it's the standard audio input we use on the cube, right? It's a, it's a stereo eighth inch um, line level input so that you can use it with two channels if you have. There's like the Rode um, 360 audio uh, microphone Mic right. that you could plug in. And then that, that's actually connected to the fourth encoder. Um, so when you configure it in the sphere, you would set up you'll see that the fourth encoder actually has an analog input available. Great. And you can actually set if you want to take the analog in or you want to take the camera's audio, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, HDMI, embedded audio, any of, the, any of the four HDMI inputs are available for that. The fourth input is also available for analog. Awesome. And, and finally, before we go and show you guys uh, what one of our uh, quick rigs that we made out of just what's inside the box looks like, um, any recommendations on what sort of network wireless connectivity? I know that we're big fans of higher end uh, enterprise stuff uh, from Ubiquiti and from Ruckus, um, but maybe a little bit down market, what do you suggest uh, for people that are just looking to monitor and then those that are looking to live stream as well? Well, it, it really depends on the environment. In my sort of test setup, I have an uh, old three year old Apple Airport Extreme, and that'll take 1080p feeds, 5 megabits per second from the sphere and back out to YouTube. Um, so it, it, it doesn't, there's not really a limitation. Any decent Wi Fi router will do, but um, for considerations like range or congested environments, if you took my setup to downtown LA, that's probably not going to work very well. Uh, we use a lot of uh, ASUS. Um, consumer grade Wi-Fi routers at the low end. But yes, we also like Ruckus and Ubiquiti um, at the higher end. So OK, so basically choosing the right router for what you need. Longer range, you might be looking at Ubiquities. With their directional antennas. Yeah. Right, and beam forming. Everything else, if you're in a fixed studio location, a standard higher end consumer router would do. Yep. Yeah. Right, fantastic. So let's take a quick look over here um, on, on the rig that we've got set up here. Uh, what you'll see is we got the sphere sitting up here on the front connected to a Manfrotto tripod. We're using an Israeli arm to connect the sphere to the tripod with a clamp. And the reason we have it outside like that is to have maximum airflow around the unit to ensure that it's operating at its maximum temperature. Now, Dylan, you were telling me that um, when mounting using our GoPro rig, you want to make sure that it's absolutely up and down. You don't want to put it on a, an axis. Why is that? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, the way our software works is we set up cameras around the equator kind of of the technical sphere, I guess you would call it. And then you could also add one or two cameras for the, the poles, like one for the top and one for the bottom. But the way our software works is you want to have most of the cameras on the equator kind of centraled around in a circle. But most of the rigs are kind of set up that way. The big like eight camera rigs are set up in a circle without caps. Mm -hmm. And then some of the six camera rigs are too. So it's mostly standard anywhere. OK, great. Yeah. Um, finally, just a couple last comments on here. You'll notice our cable dressing isn't the, the nicest. Um, we did this really quickly just to show you guys how uh, fast you can just throw these things together. However, you do want to spend a little bit more time, especially if you're in an area that's got a lot of people movement. These cables, especially with GoPros, easily fall out. So just make sure that you guys take adequate steps to, to ensure that your cables aren't going to get knocked out by accident. Um, what we're going to do now is kind of move into the software side of things. 
Uh, Dylan, um, what I want you to do is maybe give an introduction to how we go about stitching, say, a GoPro free, uh, feed like we've got right here, and walk us through what lens roll is and what the parameters available are and what they do. Yeah, of course. So um, I'll start on the first steps of uh, the software that we have. So this is a uh, software we have running on the iPad uh, iPad Pro, Pro. the 12.9 inch. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we recommend the iPad Pro basically at all times, right? Yes. Uh, we pretty much solely recommend the iPad Pro if you want to do anything uh, valid with this. If you want to have the yeah. best experience. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so the screen I'm on now is the camera selection. So we have the sphere running into a router, so that's why I'm picking it up on the iPad. This cable is actually just for, well, the stream that you guys are seeing. Um, so the view I'm setting up right now is, like I said, where you add the cameras. You can have all the device, like all the streams coming in. So Each of the cameras from your sphere yeah, will show exactly. as a separate camera. So right now I only have four streams because we only have one sphere hooked up. But if we daisy chain like we talked about before, I could see eight cameras. So it would sense. automatically detect using Bonjour, basically. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so we can have a rig with up to eight cameras, so you can drag and drop this stuff around. We could have a bigger rig with eight cameras, and you can also, like, uh, here, let's actually add some stuff. You can also include images. Um, say there's maybe only three cameras actually have a scene, and maybe the back is really close to a wall or something, then you can just use an image for it. Uh, but or also the top and bottom, where right. we don't have the coverage of these four cameras, you'll put an image, which doesn't look quite uh, you can't really tell from here, but right. when we pull up the play view, you'll see that it actually becomes this nice cap to cover any blank space yeah. that you otherwise wouldn't. Cool. And most of the time, all the action is in the, I guess, like the horizon of the video anyway. So we haven't really found much need for the tops and bottom cameras in-house anyway. Okay, so why don't you show us a little bit about the stitching then? Yeah, of course. So, uh, so we just moved from the camera selection view into sort of the the play, play view, view yeah. the calibration view. This is where most of the work is going to be done in the app, and this is where you're going to configure your outputs, you're going to record, you're going to stream, you're going to do most of your, your stuff from here once you've picked your cameras. Yeah, absolutely. So right now this doesn't look very 360 because it's a panoramic shot, um, but we have the different <laughs> view modes, um, so you can actually you know, pick this up and look around as if it was one of the VR things. Um, and like uh, a bunch of different view modes. Little planet, right? Yeah, exactly, little planet mode. So kind of, you see the whole thing. Um, but for the stitching side of things, uh, I'm gonna kind of go through the order of operations. Like, sure. there is best practices. You wanna do things first. Um, and so we started from a default configuration. This is? So this is the default configuration if you were to open the app because and what it's is our in-house rig. What does that mean specifically default configuration? So I'll, uh, there's a few things. Uh, there's like lens correction that you need to make sure is correct um, and then the actual stitching between the different fades. But the lens correction is um, the biggest thing difference between, or the biggest difference between different rigs. Uh, since this is GoPros, they have a field of view that is um, like a certain fisheye lens pretty much. So you want a fixed to focal length. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, a fixed, a fixed angle of gotcha. view rather yeah. than, yeah, that's the same thing. So uh, <coughs> by default, this ends up being basically presenting you with a field of view adjusted for a GoPro. Um, so that's why it, it looks sort almost correct um, with our default rig, but for anything else like um, like a red with some Canon 8 to 15s on, mm -hmm. Um, we've used that where the field of view is completely different. You have almost 180 degrees. You're going to have to do some adjustment for that. Okay, so just to reiterate, the default in, in the app is basically pre-tuned to a four-camera GoPro rig, just exactly. as the accessories inside our box are made for that, that yeah, entry-level exactly. rig. Gotcha, and you would tweak as you need to with different rigs. Right. Okay, so why don't you show us some of the tweaks and how you would go about stitching a proper stitch here. All right, so um, let me screw with the field of view a little bit so you can see what we'd normally have to correct for. Um, so, so you can see like the GoPros normally have like a bulging effect and it's so it can capture more stuff for the action camera stuff. It's, it's meant to have a fisheye of course. 
Um, so you, I don't know if you guys can see the software, but you can see all the pictures actually bulging out. So uh, we have a mode that is set up specifically to make, while you're in that like VR mode, uh, make straight lines appear straight, mm -hmm. so that you actually feel kind of immersed. to help to help adjust for the field of view of the lens. Exactly. Okay. So right now you can see all the lines or all the lines on the ceiling curving. So our goal would be to straighten those out. And it's kind of there. That's actually a little bit off. So there's also like fine tuned controls. So if you hold down on the plus or the minus, you can kind of slightly do things because you, you want things to be pretty exact when you're stitching these. So things. it just changes the values from say a tenth to a hundredth, basically. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And that, exactly. that applies to every single one of these individual parameters in here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can really dial in the specifics of your yeah. of your yeah. stitch. And yeah. It's almost always necessary to really fine tune these things. Okay. Uh, you can also type things in manually. Like so if maybe you go look up the field of view or the, the type of lens you have to deal with, you can kind of calculate what it would need to be. Okay. Um, so now that the field of view is correct, you can take off line mode. There's also um, advanced settings for for like lens correction that most people wouldn't need. But uh, as Richard was talking about, there's even crazier fisheye lenses that are like 180 degrees. Uh, the the bigger so you're saying you can use as few as two cameras with the sphere if you wanted to, mm -hmm. and could. we have the software that uh, can stitch and help make that look like a cohesive. Exactly. Video, it would be a bit more work with the stuff we have, but um, it's definitely capable. And some of the settings below below the fold here re really apply to kind of a niche where you have exactly. lenses that are off-centered from the camera sensor, um, lens that have different distortion in the center of the image versus the edge. So well, not really much point in talking, spending too much time talking right. about them here because the amount that we've seen, it's not hugely common. So, okay. so the, the options are there. If you need it, we sort of guess that about 99% of people won't, won't, won't need to scroll need down exactly. here. Yet. Right. Yeah. So, so one thing I, I heard right before we started was you can actually save your configurations and export them and send them to anybody else that's got a sphere. Yeah, so exactly. if you were a larger corporation or a production company that had several spheres and maybe your, your, your team in the field wasn't really familiar with it, you literally could just send them a file over uh, email, they could load it into here and the correction is good to go. Yeah, exactly. Or there may even be forums in the future that people post common rigs because there's a lot of, um, yeah, like I said, common rigs that people are already buying mm -hmm. outside of the rig that we're going to have. And things that we don't have access to all the time. So right. Exactly. Um, the other other thing you can do is store these configurations on the sphere itself. So if you have a sphere with a camera setup that is going to go everywhere together, mm -hmm. you store that configuration on the rig. Then it doesn't matter what iPad you use. You can pull that configuration, have it presented already stitched in the app. Awesome. Cool. And was there anything else that you wanted to touch on really quickly with the uh, the stitching side? With the stitching side, yeah. So once you figure out lens correction, then you need to, of course, get the actual panels lined up. Um, and so we have a whole separate section for that. Um, the, the pitch and the roll with our rig is also, again, pretty standard because it's a flat rig. But if you were to adjust it, you can actually roll the, the stream. The I image, guess, the right. Image, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can do either all of the Mm -hmm. sources at once or um, just individual sources. So depending on the configuration, there may be one camera that's not straight up and down or a camera that's even just slightly, but it's enough to, to give you trouble when you try to actually stitch the image. Yeah. And uh, the stitching is kind of two part uh, once you leave the lens correction. Um, there's like the pitch, the roll, and moving things left and right to to try to get them to overlap. To position everything. And then there's mm -hmm. also like the edge fading. So uh, you get things to kind of blend well together. So the things I was showing you now, so this is the pitch. It actually gets the thing to rotate. And uh, for, for rigs that have like tilted cameras, mm -hmm. so there's some uh, six camera rigs that are kind of pointed down, like down. around, mm -hmm. sure. and then one on top. So if you wanted to have uh, like one of those rigs, you kind of point the the actual cameras down, or you know, you roll them down in here. Okay, so this is just adjusting 
the, the more or less the field of view then for different yeah, exactly. The placement of where the lenses would be. Okay. Yeah, basically three parts is adjust for your cameras, which mm -hmm. is the lens correction, adjust the position so that you get the overlap, and then the third part is going to be blending the images so that where there's going to be missing details in the image, there's going to be overlapped, duplicated details. Mm -hmm. You sort of blend that for what, what makes most sense for your subject. So I wouldn't blend a door together but I, I don't want to cut off your face if the camera exactly. if the camera line lands on your gotcha on your face. Then okay. Maybe I would. <laughs> yeah. So so this what I'm adjusting now is the overlap. So if you see the. It's a little easier to see if you do one camera at a time. Yeah, that's a good call. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So this adjusts the overlap, so you can kind of see the the edge of the. Uh, the light there. So if you were to match them up, it'd kind of be there. If you match the shadows, oh, there we go. Um, so that is, yeah, the the placement side of things. Right. So then there's also, I'm sure you guys see, there's like kind of like an edge there. Um, oh, <laughs> good call. Um, it's like kind of like a curvature edge here. Right. So that is the overlap between the cameras, and you can actually fade that specifically. See, that's the. Oh, this the is from the other part of the, the other camera. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Okay. So this is the blending that Richard was talking about. So you can kind of get more seamless effects. And also, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's like sorry, um, kind of like missing pieces here. So if the way we set up the caps earlier doesn't actually overlap with the video, so you kind of have these black spots so you can move that down. And that's too. because we don't have coverage of the top and the bottom. It right. It doesn't, there's no camera to actually give us an image there. Okay. Yeah, but since we have these caps here, I'll show you what they look like in Rex Linear. So this is the lower cap, that's all that's there. And here's the upper cap. And one thing that I've noticed, and we'll show a video in a little bit, mm -hmm. um, these caps have been used not just for branding purposes, but also uh, paid advertisements. Um, yeah. I know that uh, even Facebook, when they were testing their 360 rigs early on, they were uh, advertisements were, were using Gaussian blur on the sides. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen other people suggest selling advertisements for these spots too. So even if you don't have more than a four camera rig, just like this rig here, uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, brand yourself or to make a little money on advertising. Yeah, and yeah. it's also often a place where there's not much action going on. Here you have a ceiling. <laughs> right. Um, outside you might have a sky. Mm -hmm. um, unless there's a flock of birds, there's not a whole lot to look at when you're when you're viewing this. So one quick question. Um, in terms of the inputs on the Teradex Sphere, um, we're looking at 1080p 30 at the highest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no 4K. No 4K. And not 1080p 60. Not 1080p 60. But 1080i 60. <laughs> yeah, so, so okay. inputs inputs to the camera, 1080p 30, 1080i 60, and below. Okay. Um, outputs, so the stitched image will stitch up to a 4K image. So for recording, for monitoring, we can actually take four 1080p inputs, stitch those together, and give you a 4K image. Mm -hmm. um, for streaming, um, you would set it, so YouTube right now is, is the platform that, that we have um, enabled in here, and that requires a 1440p stream, so 2560 by 1440 right. um, is the resolution that you'd use for that. Okay, cool, and there is one other player, it's, uh, it's Bitmovin, right? A WoW is a Bitmovin combination? Yeah, yeah, so there's a few, as far as the streaming platforms that we have built into the app, mm -hmm. um, YouTube is the only one at this point. Um, we have a custom RT RTMP option so that you can stream to any other um, player or streaming server that has this enabled. We just don't have the tight integration that we do with YouTube at the moment. So. Okay, cool. Uh, Dylan, anything left on stitching or do you want to move on to uh, some color correction? So that's pretty much the basics on stitching. Um, Why don't we pull up the sort of already stitched app to, or Yeah, rig. so, um, so I when we were sitting here this morning, I stitched together this rig just after we set it up, just to kind of get a more fine-tuned version. So I'll show you guys that now.
And so basically what you just did is you're just pulling up separate presets. Exactly. Okay, that you've saved in, in, yeah. inside these are the, the These are the configurations that can be stored on the iPad, emailed, stored on the Sphere, okay. et cetera. So this is just a much more nicely done version of what we showed a second ago to, to talk about the position and the rotation and cool. all the correction. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you also noticed the colors are a little bit different here. Mm -hmm. um, so we in the app we have a manual color calibration. So the tint before was kind of yellowish, so we wanted to get that white balance back. So things are looking a lot cleaner now. But one thing we found with GoPros um, specifically is that the exposure sometimes isn't always favorable for us. It's also continuously auto calibrating. So if a light changes to a GoPro, it's going to adjust the exposure. That doesn't exactly. happen with cameras like an A7, like a RED, etc. You're going to set the exposure, and you can set that the same for all the cameras. That's when you'd want to use the manual color, but for something like a GoPro where you can't stop it from auto adjusting, mm -hmm. We're going to compensate for that with auto color. Okay, and and one other thing that I heard right before we started as well is when using GoPros, uh, it was recommended to turn the GoPro into photo mode. So it's not photo mode. Well, yes, two things. Photo yeah. mode. Two things, right? <laughs> yeah, Fo photo mode in right. 1440p wide. That was the suggestion yes. I heard. So it's it's actually when when you turn on a GoPro, th the reason we do this is by default the HDMI output in video mode is going to give you a 16 by 9 image, full full frame image. Mm -hmm. To get the stitching and to get the wi wide field of view, we actually switch it to photo mode, which gives us a four by three image um, pillar box, so black lines on the left and the right okay. of the image. That. Otherwise, we miss too much of the picture, so we don't get the overlap with our default rig. Uh, the other setting that we typically recommend, or we do recommend, <laughs> <to change laughs> yeah. not typically, um, is you can set ProTune okay. um, on the device. It does give you some manual parameters mm -hmm. and basically turns off, um, I think it's auto white balance, but keep it, you can't turn off the auto exposure, yeah. so it's still going to adjust for brightness, for darks. Um, but it will it won't continuously try to color correct itself. Mm. That allows all the cameras to be set up the same. Okay, um, it making it easier for the auto color algorithms in the Sphere app to actually correct for the exposure rather than the exposure and the color and any other noise reduction or whatever the GoPro does um, internally. Okay, and then one last thing, just while we're on the topic. When you, what if you were recording in camera? Um, if you hit record in video mode, it does take it from a 16 by 9 to 4 by 3, right? In, in video mode, the GoPro will, uh, only in 4K recording, okay. um, so with the GoPro 4 Black, um, will actually scale down to an SD output, um, the same way the old 5D Mark II um, would. When you had 1080i output, hit record, it scales that down. That's not going to work in here. Okay. Um, with the four camera rig, you really do need to use that photo mode because you're not going to have the coverage. But with a six camera rig, if you're recording in camera, um, you can keep it in video mode, keep that 16 by 9 image, stitch that, and then yes, it'll, it should work fine. Okay, cool. Uh, Dylan, why don't you show us um, some manual <laughs> corrections, mess it up a little bit, yeah. and then we'll go to auto and watch it auto adjust. Well. So what sort of parameters do you have in the color here? Is it just red, green, and blue for each camera? Is there tint, white balance, exposure, et cetera? Um, What's available to you? It's pretty much just red, green, blue. But then you have like the highlights, the lows, and like the, the mid-tones. Okay. Basically, to, to adjust the exposure, to adjust the brightness of the image, you're going to have all of these locked together. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is an option to lock and unlock um, the color. So if I want to adjust just the lows, the brightness in the lows, I'm going to drag all these okay, together. Okay, so you can gang it together yeah. for each individual. And then if you want to then say, well, that's got a little bit too much blue, now I'm going to, oh, that's a red. So <laughs> pull down the blue. Ah, okay. It's a little lighter. So I'll just reset that uh, for now. Yeah. And yeah, like Richard was saying, this, this stuff only really works for things that are not changing exposure all the time. So a GoPro has issues with that, but since we're in a room where everything's set up and we're not moving the camera too much, mm -hmm. we don't really have that issue. So now that things are set up, it's actually pretty stable. 
But for situations where you're maybe going outside or maybe the light's changing often. Or the rig is on a moving object. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we do have automatic uh, color calibration that's just real time and it just keeps spinning up the whole time. So might be better if you start from something that the deep. Well, if you reset the color here, so we're gonna pull pull out the nice color that's been pre-adjusted right. already. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the one that resets everything. Okay. Yeah, we'll go back. <laughs> all right. So let's load a, an, an an uglier preset exactly. <laughs> before we did it all. Okay. So this is the one from before. You can kind of see it, like the panels don't match. You can really see the divide between the the cameras. So you go in here. And what sort of, what are your options over here exactly? So there's three main options. Uh, color balance. Okay. That will you know, balance the color. Mm -hmm. Luma balance and tint balance. Uh, you can increase the sensitivity on all of them, but all that does is speed up how much it can change over time. Okay. So if, I don't know, if you're at somewhere where the, the lights are changing really quickly, but you don't want the this thing to override too quickly, you can turn like on the concert. sensitivity. Gotcha. Like you right. turn the sensitivity low so that if a blue light hits one of the it's cameras, not gonna it's not going to quickly shoot one way. It'll actually exactly. accept that that's a blue light. OK. Yeah. So let's see this thing in action then. OK, so we just turned on the auto color. And the auto tint. And so, so you can see the lines really starting to like blend into each other. A little tricky with that shadow, yeah, but no. if we zoom in. Oh yeah, there you go. And, and so, what so the sensitivity here is very low. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to do this again with it turned up, it would go quick. But then you risk it overshooting, right? Undershooting, and and if this wasn't such a static scene, it would um, change too fast. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. Okay, great. So there seems to be a lot of um, a lot of parameters here. Um, with let's let's go into monitoring then, since we've now done the basics of stitching and and color correction. Um, monitoring for for those of you that don't know, it's uh, our base level model for Sphere. It's twenty nine ninety for monitoring only. Um, you will need to provide your own router to connect your iPad Pro and the Sphere together. Um, but once it's all detected, you're instantaneously monitoring. One of the questions we get quite a bit, uh, Richard, is what's the latency to the iPad with a system like this? Latency in here, um, it's, it's about a quarter second okay. um, from camera to here. So I don't know if you can see me talking, but it's kind of <laughs> hard unless you have a picture-in-picture -picture view. But it's about a quarter second. OK, and that's adjustable, right, just like the cube would be? Not in this app, although we could probably add that. I think the buffer yeah, right now so is fixed. Okay. It's fixed currently, but we are going to want to increase it. So for monitoring purposes, we can actually lower it uh, quite a bit. But for streaming purposes, you're going to want to increase it a bit to get things to go smoother. So it really depends on what your goal is. OK, and then when you're monitoring, this is an HD feed then, right? Mm -hmm. This is up to a 4K um, stitched image. image. Yeah, okay. so it, with up to four 1080p feeds. Lined up to the camera. Right, uh -huh. and so bit rates coming in from the or up to, eight, up to eight 1080p feeds. Sorry. Yeah, if you, have, to, eight if eight if you have eight cameras, mm -hmm. right. Um, for bit rates on a per camera basis, what, what's coming in for each channel here? Uh, up, so if, you, if you're doing a 1080p feed into um, the Sphere app, five megabits per second is the max that we allow you to set. Okay. It's sort of a good enough feed because you are losing some resolution when you're stitching this, even at 4K. So we pull this down. And yeah, so five megabits, that can go down depending on your environment, depending on how far you are from your Wi-Fi router. Those are all, that's why they're configurable is because there's no right No answer. one solution yeah. fits all, mm -hmm. right, okay. And um, so that, that brings me into another good question, which is recording. Um, where do you record your feed? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a record right tab, here. okay, and it records right to your iPad mm -hmm. while you're either monitoring or streaming. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and it's recording at the bit rates and the resolution and frame rate that you've already preset. There's that no difference. That you've configured as your sort of output um, okay. resolution. Yeah, so that's up to that 4K um, panoramic image. So when if you took that recording, you took it, viewed it in the standard, your camera roll on the iPad, or you pulled it off and put it onto your computer, you're going to see this panoramic view. Mm -hmm. This is the view that's recognized by YouTube or whatever when you set that little 360 flag. Mm -hmm. um, so this can be used for quick, we did our event, we're not 
streaming it live, but we're going to upload it late. later. Right. Um, and this will actually be displayed on a YouTube page as a 360 video or probably on a Facebook page. So okay. Try it. And you can play that all back in app as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then the last question I have for this then is how many iPads can connect at the same time? We can do up to four okay. um, per sphere. Um, at that point, the, the wireless becomes... It's a lot of data. It's a lot of data. If you have four cameras, 1080p, five megabits, that's 80 megabits constant just going out of the iPad, or out of the sphere, sorry, right. and out of this Wi-Fi access point. Um, so resolution and bit rate and stuff becomes a consideration at that point. I don't have any specific recommendations, um, but we'll, we'll try and lay those out for customers as, as, we, as we discover them ourselves. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to roll a quick clip um, of one of our beta testers that used this on the Dancing with the Stars finale. Uh, you'll get an idea of how it was all rigged up and what it looked like. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and roll it. A, a whole range of emotions oh, last man. night. No doubt. And a lot of them to come tonight, yeah. too. By the way, if you've ever wanted to experience the show in the ballroom from the comfort of your home, you can, thanks to our nifty little 360 camera. Go to abc.com to check out the view from right here on the ballroom floor. All right, we've got a big night in Okay, so we're back. We're going to kind of wrap up now uh, with uh, Sphere live streaming, and then we'll take some questions. Um, with live streaming, it's uh, a separate uh, software model than just the monitoring. It's $39.90 instead of $29.90. Uh, it's just a licensing structure, very much like our Cube series. How would somebody go about getting live streaming functionality on their Sphere if they started off with just monitoring only? Do they email us? How does that all work together? It, it should be available through the web store. Okay. Um, you go online, you purchase a thousand dollar license. Um, that actually is going to live on the sphere. So you only need to buy one license even if you have daisy chained two spheres. Okay. Um, for an eight camera rig, we're not going to make you purchase two separate licenses. Okay. The way the app is going to detect that is, is essentially if one of them in your current rig configuration. So here where we have the sources, if this sphere, any of the cameras that you're using, if that sphere device has the license, you can live stream with it. Great. Okay. Uh, you can also try it out. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. If you just use images, just as far as the configuration. So the configuration is all available. You're only able to stream the live video if you have the license. If you have the license. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Dylan, why don't you show us how you would go about configuring an account, say, to stream to YouTube Live? Yeah, of course. So this is like kind of the home page. It's where you see all the collection of your actual like preset rigs. Mm -hmm. And where you'd be recording. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's also the place where you could sync your rigs on your iPad to your Sphere device so other iPads could pull it. So let me manage my destination. So I could add a new destination here. We have YouTube and like a custom URL, but I'll show you the one I've already set up. So the YouTube authentication works the same as any of our other um, apps like Live to Air. Okay. Um, if anyone's familiar yeah, with so that. Yeah, so you just log in with your Google credentials, and that pretty much be it. All right, and then we've got a built-in uh, speed test. Is that what that says right here? Nope. What no, is that? It says test event. Event sphere. This oh, okay. is just an event, so you choose different events, which will be configured on on YouTube, you YouTube and eventually um, you'll be able to create events within the app. Okay, gotcha. Well, yeah, Go one thing with uh, YouTube, so when you set up the event, there's like a little checkbox, like a, a flag that you have to actually set mm -hmm. for the viewer to be able to see it in 360. So we're going to set up con some convenience things so that's a bit easier to set up. Yeah, it's right. Currently, you create your event, you go to the advanced settings, and then you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page <laughs> just to check the boxes. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you tried to without, people would just see that panoramic gotcha. um, image. 
while we're here, I'll show you guys the output settings so you guys can, you know. Yeah, let's see what, what sort of, and this is actually a good uh, uh, segue into what I wanted to ask next, which was recommended bit rates uh, for a high quality stream. What would you say is the, the good average with, with a GoPro rig like this, maybe the high end, and then what would be the low end? So as far as t just keeping talking about the main platform that we support with YouTube, mm -hmm. um, I believe their recommendations of 1440p 13? is as high as they support. Um, okay. So you don't need to go any higher than that. Resolution-wise. Um, Resolution-wise. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the bit rates, um, the 360, it's 13 megabits and down. You can go down to 5 or 4 megabits, but that's not going to be a great experience for the viewer. So right. I, 8 and above, depending on the scene. And here, 5 megabits would be fine because we're sitting here. Right. Um, okay. At a concert, it's not going to cut it. So Gotcha. Um, was there anything else you guys wanted to touch upon specifically with live streaming? Any other uh, uh, pitfalls maybe you might run into? Um, I wouldn't say pitfalls. There is, so as we were talking about before, there's in-app recording. Mm -hmm. And you can increase the resolution to 2160, and mm -hmm. you can record at that. And the iPad handles really well. The iPad Pro. Pro. The big Pro. iPad Pro. Big iPad Pro. Pro. Okay. Yeah. The smaller one will stutter at least on the play view. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. So if you really want to capture and record 2160 and also stream out, YouTube is kind of finicky about the resolutions you send them. Okay. So if you're trying to do that, YouTube won't then as accept a stream. So you would have to record at 1440. Okay. So that's kind of the pitfall there. But you could pull the stream from two different iPads, capture on one, and stream on the other. So. Um, Let's talk quickly about audio, because this seems mm. to be a question that keeps popping up. Um, Actually, uh, just one, one yeah. other thing um, that is a, a slight consideration is streaming and recording. Um, I think there should be a little warning. If you're recording or streaming, you do take a snapshot. We didn't really talk much about the mm. snapshots. Oh, okay. These can be used either, it, say you set up a rig and you want to give it to someone else to, to configure it, whatnot. You can you can take a still of each of these cameras with an un, un unfiltered, unfettered like uh, source, or you can take this panoramic snapshot. Doing so, though, will actually pause the stream mm. while it's going, just, just for a slight second while it captures that image and saves it. Um, shouldn't be a consideration for most people. But you asked for any, any yeah. pitfalls. Sure, sure. And, and it might actually be good to know, especially in a monitoring situation where you might just want those stills yeah. for use in dailies or whatever else. Yeah, set up in um, your test yeah. shot. Right. Put down the camera, pull off the batteries, put them on charge, and then you can stitch your, your exactly. rig without actually needing to have the video up. And okay. Running. And that's how we've kind of, so there's some rigs that we wanted to test, but we weren't able to get the rig or the cameras associated. Mm -hmm. So Especially we when had it's an expensive day rental <laughs> for, exactly. for. Yeah. So we had people send in the, the source snapshots, kind of how we would set them up here. Um, and we plugged them into our software. And as Richard was saying, we stitched as if it was their rig, but only with the pictures. Mm -hmm. So then we, like we were saying, we can email back and forth like these rigs. We just emailed the rig back to them, and everything was set up. Okay, great. So, so it's it's a it's a it's a potential for collaboration with exactly. mm -hmm. either other people in the industry or other people in your own production who may have better skill sets to help you stitch something off. -site. Yeah, your your okay. producer may not want to be able to stitch this, but the guy that rents it to him should know the software. Right. They can they can exchange um, that and the, do the stitch. Gotcha. Sort of remotely. So, yeah. so with audio, really quickly, um, yeah. one of the questions I've seen pop up here, <coughs> and, and something that we asked, we were asked a lot um, at NAB was, can you get uh, a, a line out out of a board, for example, a mixer into the sphere? Is that just using the analog audio input then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you basically have two options then. You can take all your camera audio and use all four audio feeds through HDMI on your system, right? You can use one two channels. Two channels, sorry, because yeah, yeah. it's stereo, right? Yeah. OK. And that's manually selected. You can choose which you want to use. Exactly. Yeah. OK. Uh, here, you would pick, you see the little speaker oh, okay. icon. Uh, this is actually the fourth 
camera, mm -hmm. and that's why there's also an analog option available there. Right, and that's, as you mentioned earlier, the fourth camera is the one that gets the analog mm -hmm. basically attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so board audio, Which camera. is what we did for NAB, NAB live show. Live show, well, exactly. We had plugged in, although gotcha. that was plugged into a separate encoder, but that was before <laughs> it was built in. Right, now it's all integrated. Okay, cool, and, and as we said, it was 96K AAC, that's that's the audio bit rate configurable. And format, configurable. Ninety six is a little low. Um, okay. One hundred twenty eight, hundred ninety two. Okay, so uh, you can go way up. Yeah, then. and it's not, but it's not adding a lot of um, extra bandwidth, bandwidth when you're talking about a nine megabit video stream. Okay, so, gotcha. Um, but all configurable. And can you just just maybe it's a stupid question. Connect a mic directly into the analog audio. Sure, if it's a if it's a powered mic. Right. Um, so it's a it's a line level um, input. Sure. Um, so as long as it's a power, if you plugged in a, I don't know why anyone would, but if you <laughs> plugged in a iPhone headset, sure, then you're not going to hear very much. Gotcha. Um, but if you have a powered mic, like I mentioned before, the little Rode um, kind of 360 stereo mic, or those little handheld recorder ones that output from that, um, should work just fine. Okay, cool. Um, and last question on audio, is there any sort of, what sort of configuration options, aside from just changing format and, and bit rate, do you have in the app? Or is that just something that is kind of... For at, levels? For, for maybe levels, or, or can you pan the audio channels and do different things with that yet? No. Not, not at the yet. moment. Okay. Right. So currently, yes, you could have four different audio channels coming through the HDMI, and then also, I guess, the analog. But it's uh, you only select one currently. Uh, none of the things that we can stream to or record to would actually handle all the different audio feeds. Okay. And um, from the the VR, like the 360 side of things, it's actually really confusing to to have maybe one camera be the audio source. You kind of want to use the analog and have a central sure. audio source. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. And it it depend depends on the cameras you're using, yeah. really. Right. The the other thing worth noting is that as far as the streaming outputs uh, may be wrong, um, but I believe YouTube, it's two channels of audio anyway, yeah, so it gotcha. wouldn't matter if you're sending eight. It wouldn't matter if you have it all spatially mapped at the moment. They there's there's not a whole lot to do except in the sort of um, recorded, the, the Oculus and, and things like that where right. they're actually like experience in the sound mixing. Right. Yeah, yeah, so this is more of a, a monitoring and live tool yeah. for 360, and then it, it's not really something you would want to use in, say, a post highly polished, full experiential headset. Well, you use, you use this to monitor the production. The production of, of such a yes. thing. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, before we get to Q and A, one last thing: we have a diagram actually showing the network connectivity of how how to get a sphere onto the internet. We can pull that up really quickly. You can see it here. It's really, really straightforward. As we mentioned before, you're going to plug your router right into one of the Ethernet ports on the Sphere. Make sure your router has an internet connection. Typically, if you're at a, uh, a third-party facility, you'll have an Ethernet drop. Um, and then you just connect uh, your iPad Pro, up to four of them, as we had mentioned, straight to the, uh, the network, and it'll automatically detect once you launch the app. Mm -hmm. um, really, really straightforward stuff. There's not a lot of thought that needs to be put into it, unless, of course, you have special needs. Uh, if you were at the X Games, you're going to need something a lot better than an Airport Extreme. That's for sure. Um, cool. So let's get to a couple of questions. One question was, any plans for SDI output? <laughs> Can neither output? confirm? You mean input? Well, it says out here, but um, SDI in general. Any uh, any plans for SDI on well, the I would say I would say yes. I mean, we, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> so for the marketing and the management to decide. But of course, we've definitely heard that from um, from our customers in showing this to people, in integrating with the rigs that are out there. And there's a lot of cameras, professional cameras in the higher end space that obviously have SDI, and everyone would rather use that if they've got it available. So right. um, when and how much, I don't know. <laughs> I would hope, hope so. So okay. we'll see how this one does. OK, cool. Um, we, we, we had a lot of questions about. Uh, being able to use this on an iPhone, is that a possibility? Not currently. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to check the processing. If, if we'll basically have a viewer app available, so you have one, one iPad that does the stitch. This, doing the stitching, no, mm -hmm. that's not possible. Um, but having this available to people to put into a cardboard 
headset sure. um, is something that we've definitely yeah, we may have considered like a for down the line. Like solution. Okay, yeah. and then um, that brings me to uh, an OS 10 stitching solution. Instead of just being on an iPad, would we have something available for the lap for laptops, for example, at moving into point. the future at yeah. some point? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it is coming. Um, we did have uh, one more question: um, a back-to-back -back rig with fisheye lenses. Will it work? Uh, and will you then have a full 360 without blind spots? Yes. So we have set up rigs like that. Uh, depending on the lens. Sometimes the end of the fisheye gets really blurry, so like the points where you stitch. So you get the fringing on it then. Okay. Yeah, you do. And then we've also seen people use those same lenses in a three or four camera rig. But then you have to increase the resolution of your encoders a lot because of Cause how you much, so much resolution you get. in the center. Yeah, yeah, you're throwing away a lot of resolution. Okay. So the two camera rigs works and it'll work in the app, but um, yeah, usually we've seen some issues on the edges. <coughs> but if it's already a rig that they use and they don't have that problem, then it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, something else that I've personally been asked a number of times, um, how can you turn this into a portable solution if I wanted this to be first-person perspective? Um, obviously, you're going to be uh, limited to your wireless range in order to be able to go live. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe a Ubiquiti rocket would be good for your range. But in terms of portable power and such, what would you guys recommend to make sure that this could be a system you can put on a helmet and walk around freely? On a helmet? Well, a helmet with a backpack okay. um, would definitely be doable. I, I don't know if you can pull back to our, our tripod setup, but we've basically taken this with an Anton Bauer battery. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we're powering our GoPros from USB cables connected to the Sphere. We can power our Ubiquiti rocket from the PoE port connected to Sphere. So you only really need a single battery, um, a big battery, big battery that can right. provide a lot sure. of power. Okay. Um, you only need one of those to get this whole rig going. So battery in a backpack, sure. Sphere on the outside of the backpack, for Max, GoPro for rig, airflow, for airflow. the airflow. Yeah, it, does yeah. get, it does get quite warm, Yeah. Um, hence the uh, vent holes all around the side um, and at the bottom. Um, but. It's basically a giant heat sink. Yeah. Essentially, okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, don't put it in your backpack. Make sure it still gets. You yeah, know, a little airflow. Air but then right. mount your GoPros to your head, and you're good to go. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And uh, any plans for Android support on a system like this? Yeah. <laughs> Probably, Which we get asked for everything. I would. I would <laughs> love to say yes, but with our current team and our current expertise, it's. If it happens, <laughs> it'll lag quite significantly behind. Right. Um, any plans for maybe in the broadcast realm for transport stream support and maybe integrating this somehow with Core? It's all possible, yeah. It's all possible. So there's mm -hmm. no limitations, just a matter of time. Yes. And it is important to, to reiterate, just like all of our other products, um, firmware is free. We will continually update this. This is something that you know we're invested in, and you know the features, you know a lot more. Say audio controls. The more feedback we get, uh, the more possibilities there are. Exactly. Um, Another question we got, uh, using different kinds of cameras. I mean, we, we've kind of touched upon this. We've used the Blackmagic Micros. Mm -hmm. We've used four red weapons. The three, 360 designs use, have the micro cinema camera with they're like little three or four mil Fuji security mm -hmm. lenses. Works just fine. Um, yeah, I, we've yet to find a rig that we haven't been able to make work. Yet, okay. Apparently. What about mixing and matching cameras? Is that I know that's probably not recommended. Hey, it, no reason why not. You can okay. adjust the lens correction for individual sources. Yeah. Okay, um, but we haven't seen it yet. So okay, um, and so are there any plans for additional viewing modes? I know we've got the rectilinear, we've got the panoramic, and the tiny planet. Yes. So. What, what other else? people would be asking? Well, I don't know. For? I'm asking you guys. So, <laughs> Is so there the anything other, else? <laughs> the only other thing people have talked about and kind of asked for is the the whole like VR box thing. Okay. But since it's an iPad, we so don't you're, you're do your cardboard that. cardboard view, um, which would be something that yeah, you do so on an iPhone. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Yeah, make sure I'm still connected. Are we gonna so pull up? Okay. no. So we don't have that cardboard mode. Instead, we use the accelerometer to be able to look around on the iPad. So you can okay. Hold this out too. Oh, they have a feed of it. <laughs> yeah, but just in case you want to see the actual yeah. thing. Um, so, yep. Cool. 
<laughs> All right, and so we'll, we'll just do one last thing, um, daisy chaining, because no one's done it yet. We'll, we'll just begin shipping these units, uh, I'm, I'm hoping by tomorrow, but um, also potentially starting on Monday. Uh, with, when you daisy chain two units, just to reiterate, um, it's automatically detected in the app. There's no additional things that you need. You don't need a license to daisy chain. It's yeah. literally as easy as plugging in an Ethernet cable between the two units. Yep, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to stack the two units on top of each other. No. I run it that way, but no. no okay, no. unless you want to turn it into a, a panini press. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and it's got good. Sort it's of got yeah, the ribs, right? It'll yeah. toast it real nicely. Yeah. So so definitely no stacking. Make sure you get the the airflow. Simple um, it, it look discovery. It's just going to look like there's twice as many videos mm -hmm. here. So it just pops up. And then yep. you can order the cameras as you see fit. You Simply can drag and drop. Yeah, so yeah, starting so from scratch. So so if you oh. Oh, yeah, get rid of everything first. So now you, go. you pick all four of them. And then these cameras are all on their side. So you rotate them. And you can drag and drop these um, in any which way you like. In any like. way that you like. Yeah. All right. Cool. It so happened that they were in order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. them up. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for your time. I appreciate it. And this is going to wrap up our live stream for Sphere in Depth. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for joining us. Please feel free to continue asking us questions. We're more than happy to answer them on Facebook. Or you can email us at info at teradek.com. Uh, we hope this was informative for you guys. You'll be able to see it video on demand, uh, I believe, on our Facebook page. But if not, check us out on our Vimeo, uh, Teradek Vimeo page. And with that said, uh, my name is Mike. Thanks for joining us, and uh, have a good one.